looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul's letter to, to the church at Colossae in modern day Turkey. Look at the way that Paul describes the people to whom he's writing. He calls them uh, first brothers. And he also calls Timothy a brother as well. He says, Timothy our brother. Presumably Timothy was working as a secretary, a scribe, writing down while Paul paced up and down the room. Can you imagine it? Preaching. <laughs> and uh, he describes Timothy as a brother. But Timothy, he knew really, really well. He'd recruited Timothy. He brought him with him. He'd mentored him. And he, he, later he sent him out on mission and commissioned him to do certain kind of pastoral work and, and apostolic work, really, and, and setting out elders across new churches and sorting things out. And he calls him a brother because he's really close. But then he calls these people at Colossae brothers as well. But he's never met them. Now, do you see the point that he's making? He uses the same word within a couple of uh, verses. Verse 1 and verse 2, he uses the word once of Timothy and then of the Colossian people. And he calls them both brothers because he's trying to make the point that they are equally dear to him, equally close to him, equally loved, and also that they're part of the same community. They are actually family. They're family members. This is Timothy, my brother, and you too are my brothers. And as Christians, we are always together in community, in common unity. Now, Paul had a very strong sense of this, of cooperation, of togetherness. Do you remember in the letter to the church at Corinth, he described the members of, the, of Christ's body as like members of our body, uh, fingers and hands, arms and elbows and legs, that were all connected, all connected to each other. And he says, so the toe that the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. That's the corollary of this understanding of the church as a body. So we are together. And when we love, when we respect one another, we are proving and exhibiting Christ Jesus himself. And of course, that comes over very strong in John chapter 13, verse 34. If I wash your feet, so you should wash one another's feet. Love one another as I have loved you. So that's the first descriptor, that we are brothers. And you might consider that it's an initial thing to understand about your identity as a Christian believer. That you are not just one person off by themselves, ready to do and able to proceed as you think best, but that you are part of a family. And you are in a sense of community with that family and that they have obligations to you. You can't get rid of them. You're just family. And blood is thicker than water. And the blood of Jesus is thicker than anything. It binds the most unlikely people together in family. We are committed to one another. And it's a strong and powerful thought. And so, of course... Paul is, is going to teach them things and in a sense, in a little while, he's going to rebuke them about certain practices. But first, he wants to point out something that he loves them, he's close to them, spiritually, if not geographically, and that they're part of one another. That he has obligations to them as they have obligations to him because they are members of the same family. Maybe your family is terribly dysfunctional. That's not the point. You still call them family, right? They're still there, annoying though they may be. And here they were. So Paul ties them together with him. So that's the first descriptor, is the, is the family descriptor. The second one is even more challenging. He calls them holy, the holy ones. In fact, in older translations, it's, it's the word is used, the saints, the saints in Colossae, which is very odd word, especially when you come from a Roman Catholic background, you think, well, saints were these special people with, you know, kind of halos or something, you know, they were extraordinarily different from normal people. And yet, even in the Roman Catholic tradition, they still consider modern people, people in, in our generation, have a claim to sainthood. And it's, it's that claim 
that Paul is making here. Only it's coming from a slightly different emphasis. Instead of emphasising what somebody can do for God, Paul is emphasising what God can do for people. And he's saying, you are saints because of what God has done for you. You are holy because you are set apart for God's service and God's pleasure. And you are responding with what God has given with faith and application. But it's God first. Such an important difference, isn't it? If it's something that you can do for God, then it's just salvation by works. But if it's what God can do for you, then you can call yourself Saint Ken. <laughs> or whatever your name is. With the understanding that it is what God is doing for you. And Christ as our Redeemer is the one who makes us holy. And where Christ is, there is holiness. And if I am in Christ, I am part of his holiness. It's not mine. It's derivative from him. He sets us apart for a reason and for a purpose so that our lives can have meaning and value. And the third descriptor, very briefly, the third descriptor was faithful. You are brothers, you are holy, you are faithful. And that's the result of our gratitude. Our gratitude is an attitude that responds to what God has done for me in a robust way givingness to him as into a spiritual union with Christ as Saviour and Lord. That's why you pray. That's why you read the Bible. That's why you, because you're responding faithfully to what Christ has done for you. It's a wonderful triad of descriptors, isn't it? You are brothers. You are holy. You are faithful. And all because of Jesus. May God bless you today. Amen.